Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer and listener, my name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Let me welcome you to yet another episode, exciting, invigorating episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. And it's no exaggeration that you're going to love this one. We're going to talk about early childhood education. And before I introduce my guest, do me the service of just pressing that subscribe button. We need your support, guys. We need your involvement. We need your engagement. Please uh, be part of us. Uh, welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom, uh, Me Bonolo Rao, uh, Rao, Wang. Rao Wang. I have to say it correctly. <laughs> yes, it's very yes. important because our names are our identification, yes. how, how we introduce ourselves in the world. It's very important. Yes, and what you've been called your whole life. So. Yes, Me Rao Wang, welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. Yes. Mkobe. It's a pleasure being here. Could you just tell the viewer who you are in terms of your background and a little bit about your CV? Okay. Um, like you mentioned, my name is Bonola Rawang. I am 26 years old or young, mm. whichever way you like to see it. Mm-hmm. Born and bred um, I pursued my degree in real estate, which I then left along the way because it wasn't aligned with my passions. Where were you at? Bansaho? No, I was at UB. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was at UB. And fourth year, I, I was like, no, this is not for me. You, you're not like me. You don't like brick and mortar no, so much. No, brick and mortar is important. But what's also important is waking up and feel, feeling like you're fulfilling a purpose. Mm-hmm. Not just you're there because um, you find yourself there. Because for me, when I, I was going into my, my tertiary background and like... I didn't know what I wanted to do or mm. be. Well, I had an idea, but we have this Setswana thing or that, no, one over Kali, one over Kali, we did a one, two, three. So I grew up listening to my parents and I took that advice. And in hindsight, I would have done it again because it then brought me to what I'm passionate about and what I'm doing. Mm. I have a diploma in early childhood education and I'm currently pursuing my degree in the same field. Mm -hmm. And I have other certificates along the way that complement that first aid training, Mm -hmm. special needs adapter program training. I'm planning to do my teaching English to speakers of other languages training. Wow, (laughs) that sounds very exciting. Um, It brings a smile to your face. So do you feel that you're really now in your calling, you are what you really want? You are are into what you really want? Yes, no, definitely. If one day I get to (coughs) God asks me, what did you, with, what did you do with your life? Mm. I will say I fulfilled your, your calling and your purpose mm. on my life. Mm. Because when I'm with children, there's no place I'd rather be. Yeah, yeah. I honestly always say to people, I prefer children any day over adults. <laughs> Let me ask you, um, who had driven you into real estate and how did you end up doing that in the first place? It was the influence of my mom as well as consultation with my uncles and um, various extended family members because yes. so I grew up around that whole that whole setup of extended family. So they just look at my results and they were like, No, maybe you should try it something new, it's lucrative. You know, but I knew from the beginning. Like when you're somebody that's very in touch with yourself and who mm. you are, um, you know what works for you and what doesn't. But it mm. was a thing for me back then that I was like, you know what, let me get this and give it to my parents, then go do what I want to do. Mm. Yes, but as life would have it. Mm. Now, um, you quit after what, two, three years? No, fourth year. <laughs> fourth year? Yes. You're just on the verge. Yes. I suspect you know everything there is to know about real estate. Well, mostly, Mm. but also I'd like to say I wasn't really present in Mm. most of my lectures. I'm going to be very honest with you because unfortunately, um, in July... Banking classes? No, I didn't bank. Mm -hmm. I was just there. You know you can be there physically, Mm. but mentally and emotionally you're not. Mm. You know, unfortunately, a month before I started my tertiary, I lost my mom. So that then 
like coupled with the fact that I wasn't really interested in valuations mm. and mm. <laughs> and Maybe all of that. Maybe the teachers were not doing a good job of interesting you. I teach real estate mentorship. Oh, nice. And I think I'm able to make it interesting. You know, the reason why I'm a teacher also is because teachers are very fundamental in building the interest of students. So mm. that also could have been a factor, among other things. No disrespect to your lecturers. Yeah, no, they're brilliant in what they do. It's just that how you connect with your student, mm. it motivates them, it makes them want to impress you to a certain level. You mm. know, it's, it, it helps them strive to do better and be better. So I'm, I'm also thinking maybe we did not have that connection as well. So did you just, when facing the final exam, just say quit there and there? No, not the final exam as such. I remember we were having end of semester exams and I honestly felt like I was going crazy. <laughs> like, mm. I was just like, this is so much sadness, I can't. So the two papers that I wrote, one that I remember is property text and another one I passed. And then the others, I was just like, I'm not going to do it. Like, mm. I can't do it anymore. Mm. And that was that. How did you then get into early childhood education? So I had to go back to the drawing board to say, who are you as Bonolo? Mm. What do you like to do? What makes you happy? Because growing up, I just observed. You, you, you get to observe. Like, the adults in my life weren't really fulfilled or looking happy every day they go to work. And I just always used to say, I don't want to be that miserable. Like they you didn't, can't... they didn't tap dance to that to that work like not I do. Really, not no, <laughs> not at all. You see, you even started like this platform. <clears throat> that means it it fulfills you that much. And mm. as you mentioned, you also have a mentorship program. Mm. So I just used to say to myself, there's this thing, there's this term floating around that's manifestation, mm. but it's actually true. If you if there are certain things that you want to see in your life, you have to very, you have to be very confident about them yes. and very convicted. So Absolutely. I used to wake up and say, no, I don't want to be unhappy. I don't mm. want to work for money. I even remember when I went for my internship, I didn't like it mm. <laughs> at all. So I then had to go back to the drawing board and I was like, I love kids. Why not explore that? Mm -hmm. Why? It was, and it was the last thing on my mind because growing up, like I was told, no, you could be a lawyer or you could be a doctor because I've always loved school and I've always loved learning. Mm -hmm. So was it on the field for sports? Was it acting on the stage? Was it in the class contributing? I loved school, mm. but I didn't know I was meant to be a teacher. Mm. But then I was like, you know what? But my personality, my energy, the connection, the gravitation towards kids, it's, it's a no-brainer. When, when did you keep interacting with kids that you realized that, hey, this is, this is where I belong? You know, even as a kid, I loved kids. It was so weird. It was mm. so weird. But basically, mm -hmm. or I, I would be in a mall and... I would wave to a kid, or I just, I'm just drawn to kids, mm. yeah, naturally. It's just the thing that, that happens. Okay. Yeah. And tell me about your diploma. Um, I did my diploma at GUC, mm. and um, like you were saying, my lectures were so supportive. They were mm. so brilliant the mm. whole way. It was a two-year program, and mm. I think out of like 20 courses that I did, 95% was distinction. Wow. Yeah. This is very good. Yeah. Is that why you immediately then went to the degree program? So, like I said, I love learning. So I want to go all the way to PhD, even beyond that, because mm. you can never stop learning mm. just outside the classroom and even in life. Mm -hmm. And even with every person that I meet, it's an opportunity to learn, mm. either to be like them or not to be like them. Mm. You know, there's always a takeaway. So that's why I then um, went into my degree. And also... In the world that we operate in, qualification backs you up. So I may be good on the field, mm. but um, parents will also need that assurance to say, okay, no, she's actually trained with what she does. You mm. know, we can be assured that she actually knows what she's doing because children are actually quite sensitive. Mm. Yeah. Tell me about Camp Ignite. Yes. So Camp Ignite in itself, it's a dedication to my late mother. Um, Ignatia was her name, so it means ignite or to light up a fire in Latin. So our tagline is ignite your, f ignite your passion, ignite your future. So I just want that little bit of spark and light in the children that I work with. And mm -hmm. it's, it's the smallest influencer, mm -hmm. like just the child knowing that you believe in them or that you think they're amazing. That's what I'm a, I'm a sum total of. Mm. I was given a solid foundation in that regard. My teachers used to think I walked in water. And if you think about on water, and if you think about it, you think it's a little bit ridiculous. Mm. But anytime I feel low, anytime I doubt myself, mm. I remember that actually there are people that believed in me. There are people Whoa. that saw something Ex explain in me. Explain the, the, 
walk on water part. Like, um, people often say sometimes you'll praise a kid for breathing. Like, a kid will be like, look. And you're as a teacher, it's, it's part of what, you, what we do. You know, even if they showed me an ex- obscure drawing, I'd be like, wow. Mm. You know, that could fuel them to become an artist. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why we give them little prompts like stars and rewards. It's to keep them going mm. because they need that. They need that instilled in them because, like I said, it becomes that little voice in them. That little voice that says, no, Mr. Mokhobi, you can do this, keep mm. going, or yeah. no, I can't. Mm. You know, it's very, very important because how we talk to children becomes how they talk to themselves. Mm. So mm. I was talked to in a positive way at school and at home. So okay. I was very fortunate. You decided to target children at the early stage. Why that early? Why couldn't you, for instance, become a primary school teacher or a secondary school ch- teacher? Why do you want them at a kindergarten stage? Um, I'm going to use the analogy of real estate. (coughs) If the foundation of this building that we're in was not strong, then we wouldn't be able to do much Mm. in it. So the foundation is very, very important. That's why I chose to be at a foundation stage, because I understand the importance of a solid foundation. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is raise up holistic children. And this is not just children that excel in the classroom, but children that are also autistic, Mm. children that are empathetic, children that are uh, are very inclusive, Mm -hmm. you know. So it it has to be holistic and grounded. And a foundation, like I was saying, is very important. You can't build anything without a strong Mm. foundation. Mm. And therefore, that's why, because if I can put my efforts and my passion and my time and my energy, when they then go to other teachers, even though they might not have that connection, they can always draw from that foundation. Mm, yes. Mm, mm. And, and in terms of Camp Ignite, how big is it and what is its achievement so far? So Camp Ignite, if I was to describe it, um, development of a child, I would say we're still at toddler stage. Mm. <laughs> we're, we're getting to learn, getting our solids, because I, I left the job that I was at. Um, I was at a primary school. I was teaching French as well as physical education. Mm. And it's been a year, it's almost a year and a half now that mm-hmm. Camp Ignite has been running. But the idea, I've always had it, even the name, I had it before. Yeah, so uh, at that stage, we're actually opening up a, a center because one of the the services that we offer is tuition. So we're opening up a center in Village, we're getting it ready. So from next week, we'll be operating from there. Mm-hmm. Because what we did is during COVID, we realized that some parents want to take their, their kids to school. But of course, because of the unknown circumstances that we're navigating, mm. they're not so comfortable um, sending their children to school. So what we did is we, we met the need where it was. We actually offered those services um, at, at their homes. So mm-hmm. that's the foundational lessons. We call them foundational lessons from when they're a year and a half. Mm. Because the earlier you start with the child, the better. But a year and a half, they can hardly talk. That's the thing. Even though they can't talk, they absorb. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's why you'll, you'll hear them say, Um, a word that is often said by the person they spend the most time with Mm. because they're listening. Even when a child is in the mom's belly, they're listening. That's why sometimes when a mom will sing or they hear the dad's voice, they'll start kicking. Mm. You know, it's it's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. And just because they cannot communicate, maybe they can't communicate in words, but with with their body language, with their emotions, they can communicate. That's a strong argument for saying you are... Against abortion, I guess. <laughs> I'm not against abortion. Mm-hmm. I'm very pro-choice mm-hmm. because I've been fortunate enough to be born in a country and to be born in a family, even though I had to push them a little bit, stretch them a little bit. Mm. Um, I'm, I make my own choices mm-hmm. because I feel like... But if you recognize that a child can hear in the belly mm. and kick when the father comes... Mm. That suggests that you think life starts fairly early. Life does start early, but at the end of the day, nobody has rights to anybody's body. Mm-hmm. Do you understand what I mean? If I feel like personally, personally as Manola, I wouldn't do it mm. because I'm an overthinker and so many other and I'm a teacher and I love kids. And yeah, yeah. I'd feel like, what if that's the only child God gave me? But we're not all the same. You know, there's somebody out there that doesn't have the same opportunities, the same support structure, the same you know, emotional... Maybe in the case of incest or... 
yeah. or rape, perhaps. Y yes, the same emotional um, <coughs> support that you have to have when you have a kid. Because mm. in as much as I love kids, I don't have my own yet. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's for a reason. It's not that I don't want them. It's, it's because I realize there are certain things that I want it's to It's a strategic achieve. move. Yes, very strategic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Talk, talk about the change makers experience. What is that all about? Okay, so I went on a Yali Education Change Makers program for four weeks in South Africa. And Yali stands for Young African Leaders Initiative. Wow, yes. Yes. So I'm very, very passionate also about personal development because for me, my competition is the girl I see in the mirror. Mm. You know, so I'm always looking for opportunities to develop myself. So this program brought like stakeholders within the education sector from all over SADC. Mm -hmm. And we were given, so the amount of knowledge that we're given in that four weeks is life changing. In like South gives, Africa? Yes, in South Africa. We were under the School of Business Leadership, UNISA. Mm. It was also sponsored by the Trevor Noah Foundation as well as USID and MasterCard. Mm. So the amount of knowledge that we received was invaluable. I, I swear it could be pushed to like a two year course. It's just mm. that we had four weeks and they drilled it into mm. us. Mm. Yeah, but here I am, an alumni and a product of that. Mm. So we're just discussing issues basically that affect the education spectrum inclusivity um how our curriculum is our curriculum current does it relate to the fourth or fifth industrial revolution mm. um do we involve our children in the decisions that we make do we make data driven decision decisions? those sort of things those yes. sort of things that you might neglect or take for granted as a teacher mm -hmm. but those are things that you deal with because if i'm a teacher and my my skills cannot be used currently what am I equipping my students with? How will they be able to then compete mm -hmm. in, in, in the global market? Because the way things are, we're all globally connected. Yeah. yeah. So if I were to say, give me the version of Bonolo before and after the change makers experience, what would you say are the major differences? So one term that I learned there that I didn't know I was actually doing is social entrepreneurship. So that's basically an enterprise. We know as entrepreneurs, you're an entrepreneur. We're there to solve a problem, right? Mm -hmm. But with social entrepreneurship, you're solving a problem and addressing a social ill. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the key takeaways that I learned from that is often you'll sit in your office and say, okay, no, but that child needs one, two, three without actually taking it from that child's perspective or taking time to sit down with that child to ask them, what do you need? Mm -hmm. Often we throw resources or, or materials at them, but we don't know what they need. Have we ever taken the time to ask them? And not just children maybe that are from disadvantaged places, but just even our kids that we interact on a daily basis. You know, for example, I'm going to give an example with the COVID situation. My heart broke because I couldn't play with my kids anymore on the on the playground. Like I said, I was a physical education teacher. You couldn't. You could only do it on Zoom. Yeah, like you couldn't interact with them. And I was like, one day we take these kids from school and tell them, no, you can't go for sleepovers. You can't play. You can't see relatives. You're stuck in the house. And then the other day is, okay, no, you're going back. And then it's this and then it's that. Like, when do we take time to ask them how they feel about it or how they're coping? Because a lot of parents were concerned. Can it not be argued that it's, it's not anybody's fault? It's COVID. It's not COVID's fault, but how you relate with the children in your care mm -hmm. is a decision that you have to be intentional about. Regardless of whether you have been given hard and fast rules from government. Yes. I'm not saying don't don't say to your kids, no, do you want to go to school? No, because you want... No, I'm just saying take time to emotionally prepare them. Because like I was saying, one of the the side effects or the downfalls that parents were looking at were, no, kids are not going to catch up in terms of like the, the lessons and stuff. But emotionally, and it's unfortunately going to show in the adulthood because that's where most of our issues that stem from childhood show up. Mm. Emotionally, they were robbed of a time. We grew up... Mm. It was that whole thing shaped us and molded us to be who we are. The kids of today are so... They're not agile. Do you understand what I mean? And mm. it's because of some of these things. They're so sheltered they're kept inside on on digital devices mm. when do they get to learn to assess risks by like climbing a yeah, tree yeah. or feeling different textures and and just exploring their senses by playing with different materials yeah. do you understand and it's like i'm saying even just socially 
Mm. Human beings are social. Yeah, so yeah. now I can't see my friends or now I have to distance and now I have to wear a mask. Mm. It was a nightmare for mm. them. So the big change for you, getting back to my original question, is you realize that you're a social entrepreneur. Yes, I was a social entrepreneur and even the projects that I'm working on now are influenced, my perspective is influenced by what I learned. For example, mm -hmm. like I said, data dis decision yeah. data-driven decision-making mm. as well as human-centered design thinking. And, and then that, that simply means putting yourself in that person's shoes, building a user persona, interviewing that person who you're supposedly creating <clears throat> the solution from. Did it not also uh, influence you to start your own business? No, Camp Ignite, Camp Ignite has... I mean, to, to leave to, the school and to do it full-time? No, 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 no. Oh. I already left the school before. Oh, I see. Yes, okay. I am, so I'm somebody... I'm a risk taker or when I feel like I can't grow in a, in a place anymore or mm -hmm. when I feel like I don't fit, I leave. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it might not be the best because I left, my, I left my job when COVID, after the recovery and when we were still trying to find our feet because I was like, okay, mm. this has been my contribution to the school. Now I need to focus on making my impact and... And hasn't it agenda. worked out for the best? It has. It mm. has. I wouldn't. It has. I wouldn't. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say it <laughs> I would for do any it other all experience. over again. <coughs> I would do it all over again. Okay. <coughs> um, there's an issue you want us to touch on, which is the breaking of stereotypes, which you say has personal ramifications for you. Can you first <laughs> introduce the subject and then, you know, help us, you know, unpack it a bit? Okay. So stereotypes are basically. I mean, when you meet a person, you judge them. It, it's inherent. Like, it, you judge them according to what you see. Mm. And, of course, that's what we can use. But stereotypes exist in society where we like to box each other in as individuals. So a teacher should look like this. Mm. Or, um, I'm glad it's changing. Only men can be pilots. You understand that type of thing. So I'm also very passionate about women development. And um, with, when it comes to stereotypes, people that knew what I did before are like, you a teacher but but you're so loud but you're so this but you dress like that mm. you know but you act like this you listen to this music but i'm like it has nothing to do with that <laughs> mm, mm. you understand if you if you if they you boxed you into your corner basically what do they say you should become <laughs> Well, my parents said I should be a lawyer or a doctor. Uh -huh. And then everybody else thought, I don't know what they thought, but they didn't think teacher. Mm. That's for sure. Um, and I, I understand. It's, it's inherent in the society that we live in. Mm -hmm. But like I'm saying, um, I hope there's, there's young, young people out there that are watching this that are not so, what do you call it? Should I say submissive or that don't try to assimilate into society mm. so much that you can become anything you want, mm. even a, a teacher, mm. you know, because my thing is if you would pick up hard. The, the funny thing when I you have, mentioned teacher is that I remember my parents telling me that in the colonial times, that was the, on the most respectable profession. And my mother, for instance, was a teacher and just about everybody was this one of the highest professions for the time. Mm. So I don't know why suddenly uh, teaching has been disparaged or looked down upon. I think because times change mm. and um, <coughs> careers Excuse or professions me. become relevant. You mm -hmm. know, there's a time where being a lawyer was rampant or mm. being a doctor was rampant. But if you look at it, who pours into all professions? Mm. A teacher. teacher. Yeah. And who is one of the most underpaid and undervalued but overworked you want me to say teacher? It is a teacher. Yeah, because yeah. let me give you an example. I don't, I don't just say, okay, one plus one equals two, two. Mm. I'm going to tie their shoelace. I'm going to wipe their nose. I'm going to open their juice box. I'm going to comfort them when they're crying. Mm. I'm going to intervene if I see there's a problem. Like mm. it's, it's, we wear so many hats and roles. And even during COVID, teachers are expected to, to manage those little people, mm. help them social distance. Um, wear their masks, they're mm. supposed to work work overtime or at home to give them lessons mm -hmm. or to prepare work for them. Do you understand what Isn't I mean? Isn't the most difficult for, uh, part for these little ones, uh, you know, stool training or toilet training? Isn't that the most difficult part? I think to some extent, but it just, it just depends because there are kids that won't eat. 
Mm. Like they won't eat. They'll just have milk. So that could also be a thing. Mm-hmm. Like each and every kid is unique. That's also a thing that we do. We compare, mm. even just as humans, we compare each other and we compare kids. But kids develop differently, mm-hmm. and that's for a reason because. So making them to eat might be more difficult than training them. Yeah, with with, with some, some kids, yes. Yeah, yeah. Or like hel- helping them. They're kids that are very dependent. Mm-hmm. You know, like how, taking them to school, for example, for them to be very independent Mm -hmm. or something that we don't take into consideration inclusivity when it comes to kids that have um, physical disabilities Mm. as well as mental ones you know for example like you also deal with those don't 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 those ones require specialized training they do which i'm currently also working on for snap snap is special needs adapted program so what i want to be able to do is work with autistic kids i've worked with an autistic kid but he was my nephew Mm. so Thankfully, he gave me that chance to say, okay, no, but you can also expand. Because one of the SDGs, that's what's going around right now, Sustainable Development Goals. Goals, Yes. It talks about (laughs) inclusive and equitable education for all. Yes. How inclusive are... SDG number six or seven? No, I think it's number four. Number four, okay, Yeah. yeah. So it's like, how inclusive are just our malls, public transport, let alone school? Mm -hmm. You won't find a ramp. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, we can go all over again, as, as, um, except if it's, like, a specialized school. Do you understand what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, we, we still have a lot of work to do. Mm-hmm. And we need people like me to talk and yeah. start these conversations. And well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how, what was your trick for breaking these stereotypes? I think you've successfully broken them, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'd what like was the to trick? think so. Um, it's just knowing yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Self-awareness is a powerful Don't you just tool. ignore the... You know, the ignore the haters. Yeah, by being self-aware, you know, even if you were to disagree with me, I'm not gonna take it personally. Even mm. if you were to name call me, mm. I'm not saying I'm not human, and it doesn't get to me sometimes. Mm. But that's my power, and if I decide to give my power away, like people are gonna talk, whether or not I was a I was a doctor or a lawyer, mm-hmm. they were still gonna talk. Do you understand yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And and the minute you give people your power, that's where you've lost it. Mm. You just need to. I call it an agreement with self <laughs> to say, I am Bonalo. I like this. I don't like that. I can work on this. Mm-hmm. But even if I don't like these parts about myself, this is who I am. Mm. Then I can know the spaces that I fit in. Mm. Then I can know the rooms that I can contribute to that I can be useful and impactful. Mm. So it's just the knowing yourself and being confident. One of the it. challenges of the modern era is cyberbullying. And these ones that you deal with are especially vulnerable. What, what systems are in place and what advice can you give parents to deal with these, these, the threats around cyberbullying? So it just, first of all, like monitoring the devices that the children use. How so? By controlling, first of all, the time, the websites, the certain um, security measures like passwords that you can put on, on for, for the kids to mm. use or not to access some, some things. Mm. Like even with cartoons, there are cartoons that are not appropriate, but they're cartoons. And because you are a parent you, and your kid is, and you're trying to get them out of your hair, mm. so you're making them watch a cartoon, it might not be appropriate. Mm. So we just need to be intentional. And mm. I know kids are tiring. My God, I mm. love them, but they're tiring. And they require so much time and energy. Mm-hmm. But that's just who they are. They're at a point where they're not self-reliant. So there you are. You've controlled the device. Mm. What else? You control the devices. You control their interactions. You also, instead of, instead of saying, don't consume this, give them material that they should consume. You understand? Be intentional about, mm-hmm. about that. I'm very for... Bring them... Small versions of the Bible. If if you're a Christian household, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which we are, what, 90% of Botswana? Yes, are, mm. bring them a Bible. Stories that are relatable to them at, at uh, content that they can consume at their age. Mm. Do you understand like what I mean? Bible cartoons, maybe. Bible cartoons, Bible flashcards. Mm. You know, let's, let's not just focus at don't do this or mm. don't go. What should they do mm. instead? And that's my philosophy. Go out and play. For crying out loud, please, kids should go out please and Please, let those kids go play. Let mm. those kids get hurt. Mm. Let them get dirty. Like I'm always saying with my nieces, it's fine even if she gets dirty. She's mm. supposed to get dirty. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? That's mm. the experience that it's going to build up. You know, just walking, walking barefoot. 
earthing. Mm -hmm. It's very important. We connect with, with the ground with the and, earth, and we're earth. grounded. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> but these kids don't. There are some that will be like, hey, oh, sand. Oh, mm. I don't want to get sweaty. So the cyber bullet threats, can you talk a little bit more and, and, and give the viewers an idea of how to to see the signs and to be able to, okay, so to avoid the threats. I can only say how they can protect their kids. For example, kids have now started third term and some are starting at a new school. Mm. So like don't post the name of your kid's school or, or certain details. Try to, in as much as we want to share, which I appreciate, um, just try to be careful monitoring. Because unfortunately among us, there's sick people. There's sick people out there that could be mm. watching. Okay, no, this kid. You mean in the society? In yes. society, yes. That mm. could be watching and that have access to all the platforms that we're in. Mm. You know, sitting behind my keyboard, you don't know that I'm a predator. You know, but I could be watching you, your movements. Oh, I could, I could even be somebody that's close to you. But watching and waiting for that opportunity. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? And even just, just teachers, for example. I know this is something that sometimes we don't take into consideration. But we need consent to post our kids. Mm. And our kids, I mean, in the classroom. Not Meaning just we shouldn't as, take our pictures with kids. No, we should. But just try. I mean, shouldn't post them willy-nilly. Like if, for example, I was teaching your son... I would have to get consent first mm. to say, can I post them? And which is what I do with Camp Ignite, with the mm. activities that, that we do. We have a form that says, okay, no, I consent to my child being put on social media pages mm. Mm. or not. And specific ones for Camp Ignite, yes, not just any. Yes, no, definitely. Mm. Just mm. Camp Ignite ones. Just the lawyer in me chipping in there. <laughs> All right, what about, um, you know, COVID? How has it impacted you positively or negatively? Oh, COVID impacted me positively because I, one of my downsides is I'm an overachiever. So I like to do a lot sometimes at the same time and I get tired. Mm. I want to wake up, go to the gym, write a proposal, go to work, do this, do that. You know, there's so many roles or things that I want to do in a day. But COVID made me realize sometimes you just need to chill. Mm. So because I'm, I like to be out there, I like to be out there. Especially during the day. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know what, but on stay put. Chill. Chill. You know, it almost got to me, but I was like, this, maybe this is God saying, breathe, mm -hmm. refocus. <laughs> <laughs> so that was covered um, positively. Mm -hmm. Negatively, it was so hard losing a lot of people, even though I'm very fortunate God protected my family and there was nobody close to me that I lost. But some kids at school lost their parents and. Sure. Just the whole confusion that mm. the world was going through. That was scary. I mm. never wanted to live through a pandemic. Mm. Like, I never wanted to live through, like, yeah. any historical... <laughs> like, if Rika Buka in that mm. regard. Yeah, yeah. Like, I never wanted to sit and say, oh, I survived a pandemic. No, yeah. that was not okay. me. Well, it's on your area, uh, based on your education, Rabatwan, uh, we have our culture, a very strong culture. To what extent do we have our culture clashing with your modern techniques for bringing up kids and things like that? I think culture sometimes perpetuates a lot of social ills because sometimes there are things that we don't talk about. But that being said also, there are aspects of culture that I absolutely respect and that I think we should hang on to and pass on to our kids. So the, the thing with raising a kid is you as Mr. Mohobi are going to raise your kid with the experiences that you have, with the thoughts and opinions that you have. So it's really a personal thing. But um, as a person, sometimes you need to reflect and compare to say, okay, no, um, this, is, this I might be doing wrong, this I may need assistance with, this I'm definitely right. For example, I'm very passionate. Our kids have a wee satwan. <laughs> they don't they, they speak English, you, you know? And like besides just <clears throat> physical location of okay, no Botswana is here on the map. Hmm. How are we then going to identify ourselves? Because culture is actually also an important aspect and language is an important aspect of culture. Hmm. And then with language, like I was saying, a holistic child, we have many facets of early childhood, like emotional, social. Language development is also one of them. Like you were saying, what if they don't talk? Mm. So when you teach your child mother tongue, those competencies that they learn in mother tongue, they can then transmit them to learn other languages properly. Mm. 
And just to give you an example, there are kids that they don't do well in school, not because they're not smart, but because <coughs> some of can't even read a question paper in English or interpret it or understand it. So we, we still have a long way to go in regards with that. And mm. with that being said, I, I would like to write books mm. and everything in Sotswana for children to get them interested and in, and in, into mm. it. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, there's another side to it where we lament the loss of culture and we think that certain practices should come back, bojale, uh, bojwera, and hurupa, and that kind of thing. What are your views on that? Personally, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it because I'm you very... You me a bit. I'm very inquisitive. Mm. And I want to know what I know. But I don't want to do it. Okay, and just to give you a background, um, my grandmother's sister uh-huh. is married into the royal family. So I grew up around... Around Royalty. that type of yes and culture. You have a little bit of blue blood in you. Yes, that that <laughs> culture all set up. So Baba Babusa Boja at some point, and my uncles went, and I got to appreciate it. And but now I'm curious also. Like obviously, I'm gonna have to shave my head, which I'm not. Mm. I'm not too happy about. <laughs> but <laughs> if that's what it takes, then definitely, mm. you know. Um, and I think it should be a personal choice. Mm. If Boja Lilebohara Babusi. Do you as Mr. Mokobe want to go? It no, shouldn't I'd, be I'd age. really want my, my kids to go. But, yeah. Because I think it's, it's age, it has to be age appropriate. Yes, no, definitely. Mm. Definitely. But do your kids want to go? They don't know if they want to go. <laughs> <laughs> They'll only know when they're there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so for, with, with initiation, I'd like to go, personally. Mm. Yes. But you think practices like that should be revived? I think they should. What else should come back? Um, should we bring back uh, the kafela? Yes. Should we bring back? Should we be more aggressive in bringing back the quota system? Yes. Our arbitration system. Yes, because you, you, if you look around our society right now, like the discipline is very, it's not Weak. the best. Yeah. And even just with with not not just the extreme ones, even just Malapi. Mm. Mm. And I get a whole bit you. Do you understand what I mean? Um, be, because kids will take advantage. They know they're smart. Mm. They'll take advantage to say, okay, no, my dad is stricter than my mom. Mm. Therefore, I can get away with certain things. Yeah, they do that. They make us clash our heads quite often. Exactly. And, mm. and just, um, mm. you know, how you relate to people, how you talk to people. It's very, very important. So I think there are certain elements of our culture that should, should be looked at also from a modern perspective. Because maybe. Are the practices that they're using, mm. are they medically, are they okay? Mm. You understand? If they are, or if they can be altered, then so be it. Because in as much as we want to maintain our culture, our world is ever-changing. And mm. we have to adapt and accept that. But it doesn't mean we need to lose our identity. No, we shouldn't. Okay, tell us about the, your social media activities around... Camp Ignite. Okay, so we're on Facebook as Camp Ignite as well as Instagram as Camp Ignite One. Mm. So we just basically show the services that we have, educational excursions, for example. Um, and educational excursions are to just, kids don't really have much of an outlet. Mm. So it's to take them out there. We've been to Tamaha for pottery, Oza for art, not on a horse riding. We also have one that we're currently working on for um, what you call independence. And then also we, we showcase different things that we're passionate about. We work with Hannah B. So Hannah B is an organization that deals with cerebral palsy education. So often, so with cerebral palsy, it requires, it, it affects the spine and the system. Mm. So it requires a lot of surgeries, therapies. So they're often trying to raise funds for Hannah. Mm-hmm. For, to go for surgeries, which they're actually doing right now. Mm-hmm. She's, she has an upcoming one. So we just basically talk about the, the, the services that we have as well as the projects that we're aligned with and our partners. Is cerebral palsy a big problem in BW? I think it is because it's not talked about. Mm-hmm. Yes, anything that's, that's under the so, carpet, yeah. it's, it's a big because problem. Because I don't know whether the there are a lot of people suffering from it. Um, yes, if you do your research, as well as autism, which is why I talked about inclusivity. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're not really an inclusive mm-hmm. society. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you about your brand, especially going forward. Um, uh, 
tell us about the medium, which is like three to five years, and then tell us about the long term, which is 10 to 15 years. Wow. Mm. You're adding 15 years to my age. I have to think about that. Yeah. Okay, so in three to five years, I would like to open up um, institutions. Mm. And by institutions, I do mean a school, but a school that can accommodate all types of children. Mm -hmm. That's in three to five years. Meaning kids with physical as well as intellectual disabilities and just kids that don't have those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then 10 to 15 years, and I, I am manifesting or putting it out there. <laughs> I will be an educational yeah. I will be an educational consultant and I will be an author of many books on early childhood development and education. I will sit on boards that will transform education in Botswana and Africa as a whole and I will be into th philanthropy and other projects. Okay. Yes. Are you going to train people like yourself and yes, no, duplicate definitely. yourself. No, definitely. <clears throat> we need to to pass on skills because knowledge doesn't have power if it if it's not shared. Mm. You understand? If I'm sitting in my in my in my home with all this knowledge and I'm not sharing it then there's no mm. there's no point. So so Camp Ignite is going to formalize itself into a school. Yes it will. Because uh, that's where we're leading to. Yes. yes. We started off tutoring in homes. Mm. Now we're opening up our tutoring center by village. And from there, we're now going to open an institution where you bring your child and say, okay, no, I think my child may have this. Mm. And then we assess, we consult with you. We also mm. help you as a parent because there's no use if teachers spend half of the day with kids then go home and the, the parents don't have those aids to help them as well. Yeah. And then we'll also be teaching kids. Okay. I have three standard final questions to ask you. The first one relates to Zaga. Is there Zaga in this profession, in this activity? Is there money to be made? Youngsters are always asking me, why didn't you ask about Zaga? There is money to be made. I mean, kids, if you think about it, kids are being born every single day. Mm. And kids, <laughs> I don't think we'll, st even though our population is not that much, mm. kids won't stop being born. Mm. And they will need to learn. So how do you monetize somewhere. this thing? How do you monetize what? You charge a service. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to sit down with your kid and draw and doodle, mm. I'm going to charge you. Mm -hmm. That's my time and expertise. Uh, okay. Yes. So there's money to be made there if is. you do it all right. You just have to be strategic. Like, mm -hmm. you have to be with everything. I mean, there are, th like, if you research, there are a thousand schools. Okay. But what, what sets you apart? What are you offering? Okay. Actually, that's another part of the question. What sets you apart in terms of what puts you... Uh, head and shoulders above your competitors in the same area? I'm a person that strives for excellence and what I produce is excellence. Mm. And just, just relating with people. You know, if I'm offering a service and I'm saying, buy this phone, you want the experience of the phone. You want me to connect with you before I can actually, you know, let you know and, and convince you to buy the phone. So it's, it's that relationship that we build with the parents as well as with our children. I mean, all, all my parents know right now, even if they called me, mm. for, for services that we don't provide under Camp Ignite, we mm. will help them. Yeah. Because that's just who we are. We, we value relationships. Yeah. Things will go south. You will suffer setbacks. If you're in this planet, it's guaranteed. How do you deal with setbacks? Can you give an example of one or two which you faced and how did you overcome them? Okay, so with setbacks, I like to feel what I'm feeling and then get over it. So if I'm feeling sad or if I feel like, okay, why am I even an entrepreneur? First of all, an entrepreneur that's trying to also be an employer, am I fine? Mm. Um, I will feel sad and then get over it. So for example... I've lost majority of my kids that we had at Camp Ignite. Mini? Um, they So they'll enroll and not enroll. So it's, it's an up and down thing. It's not a constant to say, okay, no, mm -hmm. I have this number of kids. Mm -hmm. But it's just about letting more people know about our services and asking the parents that have left, what can we do better? Mm. Why is it that you left? So mm. I think you need to be in touch to also take feedback, whether positive or negative. Then mm -hmm. work with that to say, okay, no, but this is how I can improve myself mm -hmm. or this is how I can better this. But one thing that I encourage, even adults and kids, mm -hmm. if you're feeling sad and you need to cry, do it by all means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. do it because then it will, like, you take those feelings out and then you get a, a clear perspective. Have you ever had a good cry? Mm -hmm. Like, um, 
a good, I don't know, but a cry, yes. Yeah, and after a cry, you feel like, whew, okay, mm. maybe I removed mm. a little bit of, of that. So just try to refocus. I mean, we mm. can't always get it. We can't but always it, get it right. Doesn't society say men are not supposed to cry? Men are absolutely supposed to cry. I like men that cry. <laughs> <laughs> just to divert it. Because it shows they're human. Mm. You know, and that's, that's one thing that we need to change. How mm. are we raising our little boys? Okay. Does uh, your... Um, faith or <clears throat> religious education play a part in how you handle setbacks? Yes, definitely. I believe I believe in God. Mm -hmm. And I believe that He's kept me through all the challenges. Mm -hmm. And He's ex especially protected my passion mm -hmm. and my will to always strive to be better, yeah. no matter what. So, And for different people, it's God, but it's the universe. At 26, you have a whole world ahead of you. You're allowed to screw up a few more times and before And I absolutely you cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely cannot wait. Like, you know, we often say, hey, sh that should have never happened to you, but mm. to me. But the whole reason you're you is because of that experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. and as much as I'm nervous, and in as much as sometimes I may feel like, oh my God, I should have achieved this mm. at this age. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. I won't raise own pace. Do you have a question for me at this point? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's like two or it's, it's yeah, two. Yeah, no, not only one. But uh, but if you have to ask, if you have to ask two, then uh, maybe I'll give you a little leeway. Okay. So I know like our elders, with all due respect, don't, they're not in so much into technology and all of that. But like you're on Instagram and you have a podcast, what inspired that? Well, being surrounded by youngsters at home in terms of my children. In terms of starting the, the podcast, it was, I think it was a meeting between Kosika, the Otlaka, and Sakaile, uh, with Otlaka being the main push that mm. got me to buy the first camera and then get started. I mean, we started literally in August of 2019, and uh, I had previously been on radio and I'd been interested in interviewing people, and I had spoken for the longest time to the kids podcast, I want a podcast, podcast. Enough already, Papa. Let's go. Mm. Let's go. So, having people like that around you, I, I said, Look, I'm not even on Facebook. I know, no, we'll show you. They opened my first account, they pushed me. And then, in addition to that, I mean, I, I have a lot of youngsters. Look at the people around me. Yeah. Um, they keep me on my toes, as it were. They energize me, they infuse me. So, that's the, where the inspiration comes from and, and the desire to share. Once I realized that, look, we've reached this 4IR stuff. This is the only way to communicate with audiences. If you are the kind of guy that I am, that you want to interact with people, you want to empower people, you want to share with people, where is the platform? There's only one platform in terms of social media in general. So I found myself gravitating there because I had to. I had to. I mean, my, my system, my whole system was saying, this is the direction you're taking. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's how it evolved. Okay, and second question quickly, yeah. because you're giving me leeway. Mm. Would you be open to having a conversation off of this platform about how you can maybe contribute to some of the social programs that we're running at Camp I'm already Night? doing that in other ways. I mean, my activity with Angel Network Botswana, my activities with the mentorship program, and also constantly advising entrepreneurs and sharing. So it's something that I'm only um, I'm already doing. So I'd be more than happy to do more of it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I'd be okay. I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Absolutely. In absolutely. private. <laughs> yeah. Um, have a look at that camera. Okay. Uh, there's someone out there who's challenged, who wants to hear something uplifting, motivating, inspirational from you. Please do the honors. Okay, so now you're putting me on the spot. But mm -hmm. what I have to say is big things are some total of small things. So whatever it is that you want to do, especially, for example, if you're an entrepreneur and you have this idea, it takes you taking time and researching about it. It takes you formulating a name and hearing and getting excited every time you hear it. It takes you putting a logo together. You know, it takes you... Um, dreaming about that and then actually putting that dream into action because what you can't see in your mind it can never come to to be so and don't give up on yourself um, everybody experiences challenges and we often won't show that on social media 
but everybody experiences challenges. It's just you saying, I can do it and I will do it and putting in the work. Wonderful. That's great stuff. Um, what you should do now is to share all your contacts, social media and elsewhere. People should know where to get hold of both yourself and Camp Ignite. Okay. <coughs> um, so for Camp Ignite, you can find us on Facebook, Camp Ignite. On Instagram, Camp Ignite One. And for me personally, um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Bonola Rawang. Or you can contact us, myself, as well as Camp Ignite at 76-490-826. We'd be happy to help or assist in any way. TikTok and stuff like that? No, I'm not on TikTok, you know. Uh, I'm not very social, like I'm not very tech savvy. Mm -hmm. So like just editing and... Okay. Oh, it gives me a headache. It's okay. just that I'm on social media because that's how we reach people. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. But I'd prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> if you could... But, but when they want to enroll, they reach you on your WhatsApp, right? Yes, they can reach me on the number that I said as well as on our, on our Facebook page or okay. Instagram. We're very active. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much. And for sharing so much. I appreciate the opportunity yeah. and your okay. time. All right.